Well, I thought we'd start with a little chanting tonight. I pasted a, a document of the, the Metta Sutta in the chat. So hopefully you can open it if you want to. But you can just follow along, listen, receive the words if you'd want to do that too. I'll chant it for us. No guarantee that I'll be on, on in tune. This chant is such a beautiful one, and it's also really layered. The whole path is outlined right here, so it's one that we could study for a long time. If you're unfamiliar with the Buddhist scriptures, the suttas, this comes from a, a book that's of the, of the scriptures called the Sutta Napada, and it's very sort of a poetic book of uh, instructions and teachings. <laughs> and if you're going to chant along with us, with me, and um, you can just notice the little arrow that goes up, means you go up in tone, and then that little arrow that goes down right there at that juncture, you go down in tone, and if it's held under the word, then you hold it for an extra beat. It's very simple, otherwise it's pretty uh, mono, it sounds just like one tone. I don't know what the word is for that. <laughs> okay. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties, and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm, and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none, through anger or ill will, wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So, with a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain 
this recollection this is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views the pure-hearted one having clarity of vision being freed from all sense desires is not born again into this world. So we'll guide us through a meditation now. You can rest back, finding a suitable posture to stay for the next 35 minutes or so. We can just invite a steady and a relaxed awareness of the body. Of the breath. Not directing the attention anywhere. But cultivating an attitude of yes. Yes, this is the way it is. This body feels like this. Just taking our time to invite an ease in the steadiness, this feeling connecting. And we'll do this practice today and by using images and words so when the time is right when you're ready you can bring to mind an image of a, a being who's really really easy to love Maybe a small child, doesn't even have to be someone you know that deeply. Or maybe a pet. Or even your favorite place in nature, a tree. 
or the ground. And just go with whatever comes to mind first. Just breathe in what it looks like, what this being or this place looks like. How it feels in your body to connect with this imagery. Appreciating this being's presence in your life or this place. And when you're ready, offering the heart's good wishes to this being or this place. And I'll offer some very simple traditional phrases, but you can always make them your own. Adjust the words. May you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe and protected. May you be healthy and strong. Repeating these phrases in mind, inviting this goodness of heart to move, to be felt. May you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe and protected. May you be healthy and strong. It's okay if the image falls out of view or the recitation gets interrupted. The practice, the practice is as much about being willing to begin again as anything. So we just remember to connect. Feel into the presence of this being or place. And then when it feels right, when the heart feels ready, just offer. And simply offer.
May you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe. and protected. May you be healthy and strong. We're cultivating this strength, this habit of goodness, and we're also seeing how nimble the heart can be. Can it pivot from one image to another? Is the habit strong? And so you can stay here if you'd like, as long as you'd like. Or if you're ready, you can bring to mind an image of yourself at any age. And remembering a time that you felt happy or content. Allowing this image of yourself to be full and vibrant. Feeling into your happiness. Appreciating happy moments like this. And when the time is right, offering good wishes in your own direction. May I be happy and peaceful. May I be safe and protected. May I be healthy and strong. Refreshing the image as often as you need to. Connecting, lingering, and when the time is right, offering the heart's goodness.
May I be happy and peaceful. May I be safe. and protected. May I be healthy and strong. May I be happy and peaceful. Safe. And protected. healthy and strong. And we'll pivot once more, strengthening this attitude of heart. And this time bringing to mind an image of a dear friend, perhaps an elder or a teacher. a mentor, confidant, inviting the image to be full. Colorful. Imagining this person at a time that you feel really appreciative of them.
when you feel ready, offering the heart's goodness. May you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe and protected. May you be healthy and strong. May you be happy and peaceful. Safe. and protected. Healthy and strong. Staying here a bit longer if you'd like. Or if you're ready, bringing to mind another dear friend. Feeling into the image Receiving it in your body. Resting in awareness and appreciation of this being.
And when the time is right, offering your good wishes May you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe and protected. May you be healthy. And strong. May you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe and protected. May you be healthy and strong. Offering, offering with every exhale. Remembering that there are many people in our lives that who express some goodness. Just inviting the remembrance, even if it's a kind of opaque image or even no image, but just a felt sense of the beings in your life who are, who you, whom you appreciate. And just land for a moment in that appreciation. Invite the warmth of appreciation to coat the heart.
And without using phrases this time, but with just a felt sense of the energetic offering of goodness. Just imagine our friends, our colleagues, all the people in our lives whom we care about to be all around us. And just like the body breathes and offers something back with the exhale, we'll energetically offer our goodness with every exhale. And remembering, too, that goodness extends far beyond the people we know. So having a felt sense of beings, those we know, those we don't know, throughout our city, state, and much farther. And even though we may not see it all the time, this goodness exists. It's real. And so we'll just offer our appreciation back in the form of this, these heartfelt wishes, no words, just radiating kindness in the direction of all beings. All beings in the front of us, all beings behind us, all beings to the right of us, all beings to the left of us. All beings above and all beings below. And when you're ready, you can drop the offering and just rest in the rhythm of your own breathing. Perhaps even feeling the nimble heart that can be satisfied and content with such a simple and ordinary activity. Just resting in awareness of the breathing.
I'm going to take a few minutes to stretch the body. You can even move away from your screen, give the eyes a rest. such a small group of us here maybe will be a little less formal than I had planned which suits me anyway you might have heard that we shared that practice with birds and cats and dogs and laughing neighbors <laughs> and motorists all kinds of beings I'm curious how it was for you how I was practiced tonight retreat once and practiced metta uh, mostly and compassion every day and each day I felt like hmm, nothing's happening here I didn't feel the kind of contentness that Rob was speaking of or happiness but mostly it just felt like I'm not sure <laughs> if this is doing anything and then I got home from retreat and I just fell in love with life everywhere all around me almost from the moment I walked up my steps appreciating the grass and my partner and the animals and saw vibrancy and so there's no there's we may not notice the effects of the practice on our heart and in a snapshot of time but we can have some faith that it's doing something and yeah and we've all been around people that feel just like content you know it just feels like oh yeah they're they're content sometimes our teachers can exude this for us i know that some of mine do i i particularly like the way ajahn suchito laughs so easily at himself so heartfelt <laughs> And then we can, you know, that can give us a little bit of faith that, oh yeah, this practice does sink in. We do it quite often. When I was in teacher training, um, I was a venerable Analio, some of you might know, who's a prolific scholar and lives at the Berry Center for Buddhist Studies at on the campus of IMS. And he's a... He's in robes, been in robes for a long time. He taught us, he's a very, very important scholar and exudes this kind of kindness that I did not expect when I met him the first time. And just really, he practices metta every day, you know, his, his ordinary practices. I think like four hours of mindfulness and four hours of metta. And I, I still have this image of him in mind, our last session, on even over Zoom. His parting words were, I love you. I love you all so much. I love each and every one of you. <laughs> and I was just really moved by that. Like, oh. It didn't feel so personal. It felt like, though, the heart can do this. You know, with a lot of 
with a lot of practice and a lot of remembering that this heart is capable of cultivating goodness, the heart just offers it up, right? People he knew well, probably in my cohort, and I hardly knew him at all, but just offered it up in such a heartfelt way. And it's not, you know, metta doesn't have to be a, a kind of soft and gentle, sweet, gooey flavor either. It can be real um, sturdy, uh, direct, honest, ardent. This is a quote from Joseph Goldstein. I'll read for me. I'll read for you. If I can locate it. Spiritual ardency is the wellspring of the courageous heart. Spiritual ardency. This willingness to be committed to practice. I love the word wellspring. And this uprising, perhaps. This natural uprising, this natural offering of the courageous heart. The heart that's willing to say yes again and again in moments even when it feels hard, right? to say yes to our feelings and emotions, to the experiences that we know, even the experiences that are unpleasant or we don't want or like. But this consistent remembering uh, to align with truth, to align with this, is, is perhaps what Joseph meant by the courageous heart. And the wellspring, this offering, right? this natural offering of goodness, ah, that which comes from this courageous heart. And so that metta can be this offering of, um, yeah, sturdiness is the word that comes to mind. You know, just people that are real there, earthy kind of no nonsense can be an offering that is full of love. It's full of truth, right? Full of refuge, perhaps like a tree, like a big sturdy tree, the trunk of a tree full of refuge. I was preparing for this and listening to a, a few talks, reading some words from the Buddha and such, and really reflecting on the Metta Sutta, the, the Sutta, that chant that we did at the beginning, if you're here for that. And it's such a, it's good to, to remember what the Buddha was how inclusive the Buddha was in his instructions of, on metta. And there's a, um, I came across a talk and in it the teacher Carolyn Jones um, read uh, like a poetic, I don't know if I'd call it a translation, but a poetic reimagining of the metta sutta. This, this person, Alex, who I used to know, he's a he left, he was on staff at IMS and he left to go to um, Harvard Divinity School to work on a master's degree, but he rewrote the Metta Sutta. So I'm going to read this from him and um, perhaps talk about it a little. And this remembers Alex's rendition of the, the words of the Buddha that we chanted in the beginning. And perhaps we can just take this in beyond, in a way that's beyond the intellect. That's just one way of knowing. But we can rest back and receive the words and let the body metabolize them. Just really feel the connection somewhere in the body, somewhere in the, in the emotional body as well. The emotional body that knows how to feel and be curious. 
So I'll read it a bit slower. If one has already started on a spiritual path and is trying to be a good person, then this is what to do and how to be. One should make oneself useful and be honest, really honest. One should be gentle and humble, the kind of person who is pleasant to have a conversation with. One should be easy to please, the kind of person who is pleased right from the start. One's way of living should be light and not too busy. One should perceive the world from the lenses of both calmness and wisdom. One should not behave recklessly nor chase fame. One should not do a thing, not even one thing, that a wise neighbor would look at and say, you shouldn't have done that. One should think to oneself, may all beings enjoy peace and feel at ease. May all beings be happy. One should send love and kindness to all living beings. No exceptions. Include everyone. Those who shake with fear or those who are steady and unflinching. Those who are tall, even giants or those being so small, or those even in the middle. Those who are of the earth and those of the ether. Those who can be seen and those who can't be seen. Those who are nearby and those who are far away. Those living now and those in future generations. One should think to oneself, may all these beings be happy. And one should not lie to anyone one should not disrespect anyone, anywhere. If one is coming from a place of anger or reactivity, one should still not wish suffering on anyone. Just like a parent would protect with their whole life any of their children as if they only had one, that is the way to treat all beings. One should develop a mind that is infinitely welcoming and loving towards the whole wide world, above and below, and all the way across the cosmos. No barriers, no hate, and no meanness. This can be practiced when one is standing, walking, sitting or lying down. As long as one is awake, one can hold this intention. This is a sacred place to call home. By stepping back from the world of ideas, one sees what is really here and can practice true virtue. One lets go of all forms of greed and is released from the chaos 
of wandering from one lifetime to another. I like these creative ways of imagining the Buddha's teachings. Really gives me permission to do the same thing. I've read this Metta Sutta. In fact, I sometimes will give myself something to think when the mind feels really busy and I'll just chew on, you know, one stanza or a phrase of the Metta Sutta. So like, insert it. When the mind wants to think and think and think and ruminate, just insert the metta sutta. It's a nice little tool. And as I was reading this, and you know, it wasn't the first thing that came up for me, what I wanted to say tonight, but it's such a beautiful teaching. And then I found myself, well, why not, sweetie? Oh, well, maybe because you kind of skim over it sometimes. <laughs> And don't let the heart really land and feel into what the Buddha is saying here. You know, it's kind of right from the beginning that directness. I'll use Alex's words here. If one has already started on a spiritual path and is trying to be a good person, then this is what to do and how to be. You know, like really direct. Here, I'm going to tell you like it is. <laughs> I'm going to tell you how to practice and how to live, right? You want to know? You spend a lot of time seeking. Well, here it is. Really direct. Yeah. One should make oneself useful and honest. Be really honest. Yeah, that's that heartfelt yes. Like not pretending. So honest. One should be gentle and humble. One should be easy to please, the kind of person who is pleased from the start. Not that everything is pleasing, but the heart that doesn't want, right? The heart that can be content with the way it is, even if the way it is is unpleasant. One's way of living should be light and not too busy. One should perceive the world from the lenses of both calmness and wisdom. There's a lot here. One's way of living should be not light and not too busy. Right? To remember that the Buddha was speaking to, often to monastics or people that were in robes and lived a little bit different, quite a lot, a bit different lifestyle than we do, right? So work could be light. But as I read this, I remembered the words of one of my teacher who offered me this very simple instruction, move at the pace, move at a pace where the mind can be aware. So it doesn't mean don't do anything. It doesn't mean don't work or don't be engaged. It just means cultivate a habit, cultivate a very strong habit of awareness so that when you need to pick up the pace, awareness can keep up, right? That means be diligent, be ardent about our practice. I think the Buddha is making more of a statement about ardency and continuity of awareness than he is about activity. And one should perceive the world from the lenses of both calmness and wisdom. Right? So cultivating this value of wisdom and samadhi. Right? The kind of insight that deepens understanding of into the truth of the way things are, really the way it is. Into the truth of impermanence, of the impersonal nature of experience. Into the truth of this persistent noticing of dukkha, of suffering. And valuing the kind of subtleness or collectedness of mind that allows us that kind of insight. Here the Buddha is actually pointing to both the two of the three parts of the Noble Eightfold Path, wisdom, samadhi, and then to move on he spends quite a bit of time here going through the ethical framework of how to live. Let's 
skip a little bit. You know, well, so he goes through that that much, and then before we even get to the loving kindness part, this is the metta sutta, and the loving kind the metta comes about a third of the way into the sutta, right? One should send love and kindness to all living beings, no exceptions. Those who shake, who shake with fear and those who stay steady and unflinching. And this is the ethical part, the third part of the Noble Eightfold Path that the Buddha is pointing to right here in the Metta Sutta. One should not lie. He's going to go through the precepts here. One should not disrespect anyone. If there's reactivity in the heart, be careful, right? Because we don't wish suffering on anyone. Take care of it. And just like a parent would protect their whole, with their whole life, any of their children, as if they had only one, this is the way to treat all beings. So this isn't, this, this um, some of the commentaries, this is, debated what the Buddha meant here. If the Buddha meant like be willing to do violence or something like that in order to protect people and don't think that's what the Buddha meant. The Buddha meant to create, to, um, to cultivate this kind of courageous and fearless heart. This heart that's fearlessly uh, caring One should develop a mind that is infinitely welcoming and loving towards the whole world, right? Again, above and below and all the way across the cosmos, no barriers and no meanness. This is a really tall order. Takes persistent noticing to develop a heart that can, that there are enough moments in our lives where we can actually cultivate the goodness. I mean, we, probably saw in this very short 35 minute meditation that the mind was probably not on metta or appreciation the whole time, right? It's probably all over the place. So to be able to cultivate a habit of mind that doesn't linger in meanness or hatred or reactivity is a really tall order. So this kind of goes back to the points back to Ah, oh, yeah, we need to cultivate this habit of settledness, of connectedness again and again and again, so that this continuity is developed, so that when we awaken, when we open our eyes, when we get off our cushion, there's still awareness is able to meet us there too. And when we cultivate and we notice, this is the wisdom part, when we notice that this is a wholesome or skillful habit of mind, even awareness itself, Right? Even the intention to be aware, even the intention to live with awareness, this, was, this is wisdom. So cultivating both a connection with calm and wisdom and how that leads to, allows us to act and move and live in ethical ways. And then when we live in ethical ways, then we feel good about that. And then we're able to settle again, right? Circular in this way. When we feel, when we live a life of no regret, then it's easy to be settled. It's easy to be calm. It's easy to be still, right? And it's not a kind of apathy either. Calm is not a kind of apathy. I know that I've had this question in my mind, like how to be calm when the world's on fire? How do I do that? And I don't know that, you know, it's easy to articulate so much, but it is a worthwhile practice. Right? The, the, how, the how kind of shows up in the moment when we ask the question, this is how it is for me. Well, how now, sweetie, in the middle of this strife? In the middle of this strife, the heart knows that turning away from it is not the answer. Right? But accepting suffering exists. The Buddha is very pragmatic about that. But that suffering exists. It's like this, right? Not trying to turn away from that or deny it 
or somehow practice it away even. But the heart that can feel and not reject or not um, ignore is really a beautiful heart, is a heart that's very loving and very courageous. Right? Spiritual ardency is the wellspring of a courageous heart. And in that way, spiritual ardency is the wellspring. The ardency is the outcome of this courageous heart, right? So this heart that continues to orient in the direction of caring, even when it feels impossible. Right? These courageous moments when it feels like, well, I don't know how to do that now. It seems like everything is awful right now. How do I do that now? Well, that willingness to orient in the direction like I, you know, the Buddha said this, I don't quite know how to do it. But because the Buddha said it, I'm going to have some faith that it's possible. And I'm just going to see about it. Right? And that ardency, ardency actually means, also means warmth of feeling. Which I really love that definition. It's some, that's another thing that I often repeat in my mind. Because I can get a little strident about practice. Well, continuity being here, saying yes, again and again and again, it's a little dry. But it includes a warmth of feeling, right? To feel into life. So those moments when we're turning towards the outcome is a, re is a, a capacity, a renewing capacity to be intimate, to be whole, to be present, to be wholly present, right? And then this, this ending, this is a sacred place to call home. That renewal, right? The yes again and again and again, the questioning, questioning as a part of, of being, uh, questioning as a part of refuge. It's how we verify, right? It's how we check it out ourselves. So this is a sacred, this is a sacred place to call home. This capacity of the heart to rest in goodness more often than we think is a place to call home. And then by stepping back from the world of ideas, one sees what is really here and can practice true virtue, ethics, right? And this is an interesting by stepping back from the world ideas because often when we're we're doing metta practice we're playing with ideas right we're using thoughts skillfully and we're seeing how thinking doesn't have to be a demon uh doesn't have to yeah it doesn't have to be a demon we don't have to demonize the thinking mind we can allow the mind to do what it does naturally and think right and still feel into truth in a deeper way it's like just beneath the thinking. It's often pushing the thinking, right? And we can see how goodness can be, can push the thinking. Instead of, a, instead of just being at the whim of whatever force, greed, aversion, ill will, delusion, that might push the thinking forward. But yet we're cultivating this kind of goodness that pushes the thinking forward. Right? So it is beyond ideas. Okay. Thanks for listening to these humble reflections on the Metta Sutta tonight. <laughs> Love to hear anything that you might contribute to the conversation. Barriers to Metta delights in metta yeah. often Sharon Salzberg will end some of her her metta meditations with a, a moment to reflect on all the forces that have contributed to us being here right just to appreciate them 
So maybe we can do that. But so we... Now just for a moment, just to let go of the words that I've just offered and just take a moment to appreciate all of the contributions that have allowed us to be here. Remember that the heart knows how to be good. Appreciate. See if this appreciation can push the thoughts forward that are beneficial. And then when you're ready, you can jump into the conversation. Yeah, Nancy. Hi. Hi. Good to see everybody. I'm here in Portland, Oregon. Nancy, she, her. Um, it's funny, I have a strange relationship with loving kindness practice, and it's not my go-to mm -hmm. so often. Um, but every time I do, one of the things that I do, and it's so, it has so much potential for opening my heart to um, go through the whole ritualistic different people. And one of the things that's really profound for me often is to choose someone who's just an acquaintance, a neighbor down the block, you know, that I, I don't talk with very often or a clerk at the grocery store and really notice everything that I can notice about the physical appearance of that person. Are they smiling? Are they forlorn? Are they withdrawn? What's their posture like? Uh, you see tension or ease on the face and it just opens up that connection so much. Um, and then working with a difficult person, um, doing the same thing, but really you know, paying attention to the nuance of my own reactivity, the nuance of the other person's reactivity, and just seeing it, seeing it for what it is and remembering conditioning and causes. And, and uh, it opens my heart when I do that um, because none of it's personal. And I can touch into that when I do that. And so I find that really helpful. I, one, of my, one of my things that I really love to do when I bump it, especially with politics and politicians, <laughs> I will often think to myself, well, you too were once a newborn unconditioned baby. <laughs> yes. And I just find a little sweetness there and it just can open something up, even if it's just a tiny little bit. Yeah. So I, I like to, I like to practice in that way, making it a little frivolous, maybe from time to time and um, bring a little levity because it, it always seems to touch into my humanity. And, and then I can have some sense of shared humanity mm. um, with the other person. And when you were, were when you were guiding Shelly, I thought, okay, when's the acquaintance going to come? When's the difficult person going to come? She's just staying with all these good people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did that tonight. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I just wanted to share my own my own relationship with it and what I have found that opens me up. And, and again, in particular, the acquaintance, the person that, you know, I'll just often look past, but if I bring that person to my mind's eye, I'll see some details. Mm -hmm. and I'll see the sad eyes, you know, the slump shoulders, whatever. And it's just so, it's just sweet. So anyway, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and as Nancy was pointing out, the 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 traditional trajectory. Well, the traditional tra trajectory is actually to start with self, and then to move on to a dear friend, and then to a neutral person, and then to a difficult person, and then to all beings. But here in the United States, um, 
teachers have found that it's often difficult to start with oneself. And so starting with the benefactor before moving to oneself. So like somebody who doesn't talk or an animal or a tree, you know, might be easy. But it's also good to remember that, you know, that the heart, that the, the cultivation is, is always here. And so it may feel like it's for someone, but it's actually to be felt here and now, right, in this heart. So in that way, it doesn't so much matter, you know, like sometimes we can agonize over who we're choosing or is it the right person or different people, like Nancy was saying, bring up different aspects of a different, like um, make love a, a more full possibility, like reflect back our own humanity, for example, or remember that, oh, even difficult people have beautiful you know, we're once a small child and there's beauty there that maybe didn't go away. So love becomes more full or metta becomes more full as we practice with different people from different aspects of our lived experience or even nature or four-legged creatures, right? This kind of makes the possibility of love more full. But the that fullness is always felt here. So as we practice and as metta becomes a more reliable habit, becomes a stronger cultivated habit, then it becomes more nimble. It just naturally flows that way. So in that way, like when love is strong, it doesn't, doesn't really care who the person is. It just will go there. Just in that example that a uh, venerable Analio, he didn't know many of us, but love just easily flowed from the heart in lots of directions, right? So that kind of radiating energy in all directions was actually the kind of practice that was practiced at the time of the Buddha. I believe that the Buddha actually taught that way in radiating, and the phrases were off a little a little later add on. But that natural flowing, that the metta sutta that feels like such a high bar is it's not such a high bar when metta is strong, right? So if, if you just stayed with yourself for three hours and felt the strength of metta and then, you know, noticed, oh, metta flows easily to all beings in my neighborhood or something like that, that would just be fine because you're still cultivating the habit of metta, right? You're still cultivating that strength, that, um, that beautiful attitude that knows no boundaries. Yeah, Jessica. Hi. Good evening. Thanks for the thanks for the practice. I um, I guess what's coming to my mind to talk about is is a little bit the um, sort of like you know I have this this pet, this animal that somebody's pet that's here that I just take care of and and like she's she's a she's a great being to practice with and like a lot of the animals I work with are great beings to practice with. And what I notice often is like you know their behavior or something will be up with them and and like you know. And often, and often when I'm walking them, especially, but like I'll be bothered by something, and then, then it's lately, it's, you know, it's becoming more and more apparent to me that like what's getting reflected is something that's in this heart or this this mind that's that the behavior is reflective of, and and like you know, and so like and this happen this is happening in other areas and aspects of my life where I'm sort of seeing like you know whenever the resistance that I'm seeing is the resistance that's present, and so. When you say that like meta is, you know, meta is always happening here, is also this way of I think of of like sort of teasing out some of the ways in which we're like enemies in our own hearts, or, you know, or we've tossed out parts of ourselves that are that are not acceptable or not good enough or something like that, where we could maybe start opening the door to some of those ways in which we have shut our door to ourselves. Yeah, it seems like to me that that's like most effective activist location I have at this point <laughs> is to be teasing those things out and trying to open my heart to those parts of myself. That's so wise. Yeah, we're so often projecting onto someone else what's we're missing. We're missing what you're what you're pointing to. Like, oh that's happening right here. But instead we go, oh I bet that person's really angry at me or I bet they don't like me or, you know, I bet something. But that's just a projection because we don't actually know a lot of the time. But what we're feeling is some kind of uh, some kind of rub right here.
Yeah, Rob. Yeah, I'd like to share. Um, so my name is Rob. And uh, like Nancy, um, Meta is not like my primary go to when I sit. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, I usually do it only in like this kind of setting, uh, like a formal setting. I have noticed over the years that I have done this, though, that when I practice meta, my defense is lower. Um, some of you know that, like, over the last couple of years, um, so I live not far from Common Ground Meditation Center, which was almost ground zero for the unrest in Minneapolis. I've had a lot of fear. Um, you know, crime in the city has just absolutely skyrocketed. I've been victimized by crime on multiple occasions, and I've got a lot of fear. But when I practice this particular practice, I notice that a lot of that anxious anxiety, fear, unrest, it, it settles down in me and I'm able to almost see more clearly. Um, yeah, so um, I, I do like this practice. I like it a lot. It helps me feel calm. It helps me feel safe. It helps me feel Nancy also used the term common humanity. Uh, that it, it helps me feel that as well. Um, anyways, that's, that's what I got. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that, Rob. Reminds me of a, I don't have it in front of me, but there's a, a part of Sharon Salzberg's book, Faith, that she's talking about something that her teacher, Upandita, said to her. And it was something like, the heart's going to be full of something, so why not metta? Right? <laughs> I think it's just what you're saying. Like, the heart that naturally gets fearful, then practicing metta, oh, it's not fearful because it's full of metta. <laughs> There's no room for fear. Oh, look at that. It's 8.30. Would have had you here all night. It's good to be together. Thank you so much for your practice, everyone.